You have already received so many invitations this morning. Have you heard them? Come. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Come and fill our hearts with God's peace. Come, let us join our friends above on angels, on eagles' wings of perfect love. Come, O perfect love of God to drive out all of our fears. Each of these invitations this morning is intentional and it's personal. And I ask you to consider what God is inviting you to this morning. Last week we concluded a series on Christian stewardship, an invitation to wholehearted generosity. And we invited you to deepen your faith and your trust of God by acting on your love for Him. Some of you made financial commitments and others joined our prayer chain or volunteered for service in new ways or promised to share your time and your talents in this church, in our local community, and in the wider global world. And there's still time to RSVP. There are some forms on that back table as you walk out the door to the left. This morning we come showered with invitations. We come with our feet firmly planted on the shoulders of those saints of God who have gone before us. And in the United Methodist tradition, the All Saints celebration is not a day to pretend. To pretend that our mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, grandparents, friends, and neighbors were saints, were perfect in the Catholic sense. It is a day to honor and to give thanks that even imperfect people, the people whom we have loved and lost, have invited us to follow in their example of a life in Christ, truly, authentically, even unto death. Many of those whom we recognize today lived long, full, dedicated lives filled with Christ's joy in their song, in their service, and in their devotion. They were not perfect. We are not perfect. But all of us can be perfected through the love of Jesus Christ if we learn to love as he first loved us. This morning's scripture gives us some concrete suggestions about how to love like that. It is from a letter to the earliest Christian churches in Asia Minor attributed to St. Peter. Many scholars argue about whether or not he was the actual author and when it was written exactly, sometime between the years 60 and 160, when the church was just starting out. But all of the theological debates aside, the content of this letter of 2 Peter is just as powerful now as it was when it was written thousands of years ago. It says the best invitation that we have ever received is to get to know Jesus Christ. Some of the saints that we honor today may have offered us that invitation. Others of us received such invitations from people that we clearly remember, Sunday school teachers, neighbors, family members, or friends. And I'm sure if I asked you right now, when you first came to know or encounter our risen Savior and Lord, many of you could tell a vivid, personal story about someone who went out of their way to extend a radical invitation to you. And there may be others of you, of us, who have been Christ followers for so long that you don't even recall when you received the invitation. When I asked one of the saints whom we are honoring today, as I visited him in hospice, when he first became a Christian, he said, I don't rightly remember. It seems I have always been one. What a legacy. So whether you are one or not this morning, whether you are a Christian or not, you are welcome in this place, in this house of prayer, in this gathering place for all the nations. All are invited to come together and worship. Those who have much faith and those who have little those who have known and walked with God for a very long time, and those who have never even heard of Jesus or dared to enter into a relationship with him. This is a sanctuary, a safe house, a sacred place where we can come 
to shed our masks and to talk about and think about the love of God. But not only that, this is a place where we can come to experience, to long for and reach out and touch that life-changing love that God is offering to us. The best way to deeply experience God is to dive in through worship. And this may not be the kind of building where you worship best. Some people love these big, old, historic churches with their beautiful stained glass windows. But other people need a smaller, quieter, darker space. Some of us need to be outside, surrounded by the beauty of God's creation. So wherever and however you do it best, worship is crucial to a healthy and happy life. Because without worship, we begin to focus inwardly on ourselves, our goals, our problems, our solutions. As we turn inward, we become more egotistical and more self-serving. We forget the perfect love of God that cast out fear. And we begin to feel overwhelmed or angry or anxious and judgmental. For the past few months, our strategic planning team has led you in the process. They've worked with you. They've listened to you to define your priorities in this church, in this community, at this time of rapid growth and transition all around us. So this morning, we will begin our top five countdown of your priorities. And number five is excellence in worship. You said that offering the most passionate, well-organized, artistic, creative, and energized worship experience possible is extremely important to you. From your pastor to guest speakers, from musicians and singers to dramas and children's sermons and even technology, we want to offer God our very best in worship, the first fruits of our relationship with the divine. And in order to achieve excellence, we must begin by being honest. As I said, we are not perfect. I am not perfect. You will not love every sermon or every song that you hear or sing here in this church. And every story will not resonate with you. Every drama will not hit home. But we are not here in church to be entertained or to consume worship. We are here together to co-create worship. Each of us has an active role in acknowledging the centrality of God in our lives and in working together to invite God's spirit to dwell among us. What you bring into this place is just as important as what you hear or receive here. Because if you don't experience God here or anywhere else in your life, I dare say it is not the fault of any speaker or singer or musician or actor or worship leader. We must all tune in our hearts and cultivate worship that is deeply personal and also communally invitational. I believe and I know that we can change our local community and the wider world if we begin with ourselves and our families. My mom shared a quote with us this week from the former First Lady, Barbara Bush, who said what happens in our own homes is far more important than what happens in the White House. She encouraged us to love and to care for our families, to feed them well, to read to our children. And she stopped short of saying it, but I could hear in her message that she must also believe that worship begins at home, in our hearts, in the privacy of our own rooms. Your top four most important strategic priority is also what I would consider a Peter-inspired priority. Peter was the one focused on creating the church, the rock that Jesus built the early Christian church on. And you said for your number four priority that you want well-trained spiritual leaders, both ordained clergy like me and laity, the non-seminary trained leaders who lead our worship our classes, our Bible studies, and our small groups. This tenet is crucial because when we begin with honesty, we must take the next step forward as we lead. 
We must educate ourselves. We must prepare ourselves for the work that God has called us to do. There are so many pastors, missionaries, and evangelists in the world and on TV today who have not taken the time to dive deep into God's scriptures and to receive training before they step out to lead. And many of those spiritual leaders end up doing more harm than they do good. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, gives us clear steps to follow. So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given, complementing your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love, each dimension fitting into and developing the others. You see, academic training is important and helpful, but it can't keep us from doing harm. There is a step that is also very important when we think about how well-trained our leaders are, and that is those who are walking the walk of faith, who are taking conscious steps to improve their character, to enrich their spiritual knowledge and wisdom, to become more disciplined and more aware of God's presence in our lives, those who are learning to wait for God's timing and leading while maintaining a childlike sense of awe and wonder at the foot of an amazing God, those leaders who are cultivating wholehearted hospitality to welcome the stranger, the outsider, the outcast. And over and through it all, through this entire walk and all of the work that it requires, is the generous, grace-filled, overflowing, life-shaking love of Jesus Christ that can fuel every moment of this journey. Each dimension of our faith and our personality moving on towards Christian perfection, in the words of one of our United Methodist founders, John Wesley. He said, we are all a work in progress. And I would add that in order to progress, we all have to do the work. As we come now to honor the legacy of the saints gone before us, let us quietly consider their work completed and our work still to accomplish as we seek to build and become the church that shows the world what God's love really means. Amen. Amen. Amen.